on the vast, seemingly endless ocean, four ships were making their passage. The fleet was Portuguese, and the sailors on board had not seen land in three long weeks. But this was only a portion of the long journey that they had endured. Their voyage had been an impressive feat of navigation and exploration never before attempted by a European. They had departed from Lisbon and had traveled for more than 10 months, going a distance that was equivalent to half the circumference of the Earth. The commander was a man named Vasco da Gama. He had been appointed directly by the King of Portugal for this task. He and his men together had made their way around Africa and then onwards into the vast unknown that was the Indian Ocean. For da Gama, this mission was more than just procuring a piece of the lucrative spice trade for his king. It was also a mission to secure a foothold for his religion. But his expedition had come very close to complete disaster numerous times. Vasco da Gama had seen his men fight the rigors of malnutrition, the ravages of disease, and the misfortunes of armed conflict. The question now remained, had it all been truly worth it? Suddenly, along the eastern horizon, emerging from the ocean mist, something came into view. It was not just land. What they saw was a vast row of impressive mountains that stretched along the entire horizon. This was no simple island. This was a subcontinent. In the final years of the 15th century, dramatic changes were happening in the Iberian Peninsula. Bartholomew Diaz had rounded the tip of Africa, and Pero de Colvillon had made it to the city of Calicut in India. The combined discoveries that these explorers had made put Portugal on the verge of extrapolating the ultimate goal, finding a sea passage to the lucrative spice markets of the Indian subcontinent. However, King John II of Portugal was forced to divert his attention and patronage away from discovery and exploration to the political arena. He was embroiled in vicious campaigns of crusade in North Africa. In 1491, his only son and heir was killed in an accident, prompting problems of succession. And the very next year, 1492, the Portuguese king would face a humanitarian crisis. It was that year that neighboring Castile and Aragon had completed the Reconquista by defeating the last kingdom of Islam in Iberia. They soon afterwards expelled the Jews, many of whom would find refuge in Portugal. But this relocation would put a considerable strain on the Portuguese crown. However, these events were soon to be eclipsed by one of the greatest flashpoints in history. It was on March 3, 1493, that a ship struggled into the harbor of Restelo, a small village near Lisbon. The name of the ship was the Santa Maria, and on board was a Genoese explorer sailing under the flag of Spain. His name was Christopher Columbus, and he carried word of a vast new world that he had just stumbled upon. Now, some argue that Columbus intentionally landed in Portugal to rub his discovery in King John II's face. The king, after all, had previously rejected his expedition. Others say that the Genoese captain barely made it to land. Either way, a confrontation with Spain seemed inevitable as word of Columbus's voyage spread throughout Europe. King John immediately laid claim to the new territory that Columbus had just discovered, citing a violation of a prior treaty. As a result, he began to tremendously expand the Portuguese navy. Spain likewise also geared up for war, but knowing that the Portuguese navy was bigger, the Catholic monarchs, Isabella and Ferdinand, decided to appeal to the Pope to intercede. The pontiff at the time was Alexander VI, the Borgia Pope, who had managed to come to power just the year before. He was considered a Spaniard, technically Aragonese. The man was instrumental in putting Isabella on the throne. The two were on excellent terms, and this is perhaps the reason why the Castilian queen had cunningly chosen this path. The Pope would pass several papal bulls to literally establish spheres of influence for the two Iberian powers. Though it needs to be mentioned, these documents heavily favored Castile. Kristen Downey in the book The Warrior Queen explains what happened next. Quote, The Portuguese naturally were not happy with the Pope's ruling. 
Queen Isabella and King João of Portugal therefore negotiated their own division of the globe. In talks that were held in Castile at the town of Tordesillas, the agreement that they reached on June 7, 1494, known as the Treaty of Tordesillas, pushed the north-south dividing line west 370 leagues, approximately 1,200 miles, from the islands of Cape Verde, instead of the Pope's 100 leagues to the west, thereby allowing Portugal to retain all rights to the coast of Africa. The resolution of the dispute, at least at this time, and from the perspective of Queen Isabella and King Joao, was that Spain now owned the western side of all new lands, and Portugal owned the eastern section. The two cousins had divided the cookie in half." End quote. It should be noted that Portugal may have already known about the eastern edge of South America, that is, Brazil, at this time, rather than the official discovery date of 1500 by Cabral. The world had been divided, Spain increasingly a rival would now be headed to the west, and Portugal was free to head to the east. In terms of exploration, or perhaps exploitation, it was time for the Portuguese to get back to work. King John II would reinvigorate his plans to find a sea passage to India, but he would never see his campaigns come to light. In 1495, John II, once regarded as the perfect prince, at the age of 40, died without an heir. His first cousin, Manuel, who would be known as the Fortunate King, would come to power. Roger Crowley, in his book The Conquerors, describes him well. Quote, the new king had inherited a streak of messianic destiny that ran deep in the Portuguese royal house of Aviz. Christened with the name Emmanuel, that is, God is with us, he saw mystical significance in his coronation. He was 26 years old, and it had taken extraordinary circumstances to place him on the throne. That is, the death or exile of six people. He saw his kingship as a sign that he had been chosen by God. The India plan, which had faltered in the later troubled years of King Zhuao's reign, became the primary outlet of Manuel's ambition. He firmly believed that he and he alone had inherited the mantle of his granduncle, Enrique the Navigator. End quote. In the General Council of December 1495, King Manuel faced opposition from his nobility about engaging in any long-term voyages. His response was to decisively overrule them. Instead, he appointed a man of minor nobility to take command of a new fleet that he had just assembled. Its mission was to find the yet elusive sea route to the spice markets of India. The man that the king had chosen to do this job was named Vasco da Gama. Vasco da Gama was born in 1460 in the city of Sines, Portugal. His father, Estevo de Gama, and his mother, Isabel Sodre, had five sons, of which Vasco was the middle child. However, there is very little known of his childhood. As he matured, he was regarded as being intelligent, excellent with mathematics, and well-versed with navigation. It was also said of him that he had a very short temper. Indeed, as his life story would unfold, he increasingly embraced the dark side. At the age of 20, he pursued a military and religious path. Like many members of his family, he joined the ranks of the Order of Santiago, and in time he would become a fervent defender of the faith. Thus, throughout his adult life, he would always have a formidable hatred of Islam. The Portugal that da Gama was brought up in was rapidly changing. Lisbon had become a remarkable port. It was abuzz with activity, vibrant with exotic goods. King Manuel had taken the throne to a kingdom that now had over 80 years worth of cutting-edge maritime experience, from exploration to trading to shipbuilding. It showed in the people Portuguese sailors were eager to expand their trading empire. It also showed in the vessels that were being built in the ever-expanding shipyards. Portugal wasn't just producing ships of exploration, they were bigger, faster, and increasingly better armed. High-quality bronze cannons and swivel guns had become commonplace, manned by German and Flemish gunners, giving new voyages a decisively offensive capability. Vasco da Gama was given four ships by the crown. Two were Carax, named after archangels, the São Rafael and the São Gabriel, 
One was a caravel named the Berio, and the last was a large supply ship. No expense was spared on equipment. The ships carried the best maps, astrolabes, and cannon. The Gama was given 2,000 gold cruzados, a massive sum, as was his brother Paolo, who would command the São Rafael. Accompanying him would be a host of extremely competent sailors, including Bartholomew Diaz, the first explorer to round the tip of Africa, and joining them would be his brother, Diogo Diaz. July 8, 1497 was considered an auspicious day by the court astrologers. On the banks of the Tagus, or the Teo River near Lisbon, de Gama led his men to the water in a sacred procession flanked by priests and the nobility. With much fanfare, the crews were taken aboard their ships, and soon the fleet was underway. Within one week, they had made it to the Canary Islands. With favorable winds at their back, they were able to push further south, but shortly thereafter, a thick fog blinded the fleet, which became separated. However, Vasco da Gama had given instructions for exactly this type of contingency. A rally point had been established on the island of Santiago in the Cape Verde archipelago. By July 26th, the fleet had been reassembled. For the next week, the ships remained docked at Santiago, taking in fresh supplies and as much water as they could hold. It was here that Bartholomew Diaz decided to remain. It was not until August 7th of 1497 that the fleet departed. Now, using the knowledge of the ocean currents and the pattern of the winds established by the work of Bartholomew Diaz and other Portuguese explorers, the expedition would now take an absolutely astonishing course, Roger Crowley explains. Quote, the expedition was about to embark on a maneuver for which there was no known precedence. Some 700 miles south of the Cape Verde archipelago, about 7 degrees from the equator, instead of following the familiar contours of the African coast, the Gabriel and its following vessels turned their rudders to the southwest and plunged into the center of the Atlantic in a huge looping curve. The land behind them vanished. The ships drove onwards briskly into the unknown and were swallowed up in the vastness of the ocean. Gama's course followed the counterintuitive truth established by Bartholomew Diaz nine years earlier that to round Africa it was necessary to swing away out into the ocean to pick up the westerly winds in order to carry the ships past the Cape of Good Hope. But the Gabriel's course was a huge magnification of the earlier experiment. By doing this, it was evident that by the end of the century, Portuguese navigators must have had a clear idea of how the winds of the Southern Atlantic worked. End quote. The course that the fleet took was a vast arc out into the Atlantic. Whereas Bartholomew Diaz on his journey had been away from land for 30 days, this portion of their voyage would last 93 and covered a distance of over 4,500 miles. To give this modern context, that's like flying from Lisbon to New Delhi. Now there is a very mysterious aspect to this leg of the voyage. Two weeks in, on August 22nd, the chronicler Alvaro Velo documented seeing birds, signifying proximity to land. Then his journal of events goes silent for two months. Could there have been nothing of significance to note during this time? Or, as some have theorized, had the voyage come into contact with the eastern coast of South America, and was the lack of documentation a means of the Portuguese crown to keep this knowledge hidden from its rivals? The resolve of the crew was tested to the extreme during this time. Food began to rot, fresh water became scarce, fever, dysentery, malnutrition, and scurvy would claim many lives. Once they had made it past the equator, even the reassuring North Star was lost behind the horizon. Then, on November 4th, 1497, the African coast was spotted and the fleet came to anchor at St. Helena Bay. Now, granted, this was northeast of the Cape of Good Hope, but they still had made it a long way. The ships were eventually repaired and supplies were procured. Now, when the pastoral people of the area were encountered, the Gama initially approached them with good intentions. However, hostility would eventually break out, leading to several armed skirmishes. For Vasco, this was a turning point on his outlook. Increasingly, away parties would be heavily armed. The Gama's temperament had changed to shoot at even the slightest provocation. On December 2nd, 1497, the fleet arrived at the Bay of the Cowherds, where Bartholomew Diaz had previously made landfall. 
by December 15th, they had passed Diaz's last padrao, that is his final stone marker. The passage to India now lay before them. The fleet proceeded to hug the eastern coast of Africa, but as they went, scurvy set in with a vengeance. The disease would ravage the crew. Crowley gives us insight, quote, The symptoms of scurvy were advanced and many of the crew were in a ghastly state. Their hands, feet, and legs were monstrously swollen. Their bloody and putrid gums grew over their teeth. As a result, most of the men could no longer eat. The smells were atrocious, wounds no longer healed, and the men of the fleet began to die." End quote. On January 22, 1498, the debilitated fleet reached the delta of a massive river. It was here that hippopotamuses and crocodiles were seen. This was the mighty Zambezi River, and it would save the expedition from complete annihilation. It wasn't so much the clean air and the medical interventions which the crew figured was the reason why everyone was getting better, but rather the abundance of fruit that was found along the banks of the river with the critically needed vitamin C. For a month, the fleet anchored off the delta and recuperated. A padrao dedicated to Saint Raphael was placed. Eventually, the ships left the Great River behind on February 24th, but a few days later on March 2nd, they spotted a large bay. When the caravel, the Berio, was sent in to investigate, she ran aground on a sandbank. As the crew attempted to get her free, they were approached by men in canoes who invited them to come into the bay. The language that they spoke, however, was unmistakable. It was Arabic. Unknown to Dagama and his crew, the Zambezi marked the beginning of the lands belonging to the Sultan of Mozambique, a country that was Muslim. The Portuguese had now just entered into a vast new world. The Indian Ocean, after all, is 30 times the size of the Mediterranean, which mirrored its complexity. Roger Crowley once again puts it incredibly well. Quote, Unlike Columbus, the Portuguese had not burst into silent seas. For thousands of years, the Indian Ocean had been the crossroads of the world's trade, from Canton to Cairo and from Burma to Baghdad. This was all done through a complex interlocking of trading systems, maritime styles, cultures, and religions, not to mention a series of important hubs. Malacca on the Malay Peninsula, larger than Venice, for goods from China. Calicut on the western coast of India for pepper. Or Muz, gateway to the Persian Gulf and Baghdad. Aden at the entrance of the Red Sea and the routes to Cairo, which was the nerve center of the Islamic world. It dispatched gold and slaves from Africa, incense and dates from Arabia, horses from Persia, opium from Egypt, porcelain from China, sulfur from Sumatra, diamonds from the Deccan Plateau. No one had a monopoly on this terrain. It was too extensive and complex. It constituted a vast and comparably peaceful free trade zone. Over half the world's wealth passed through its waters in a commercial commonwealth. God, it was said, had given the sea in common. End quote. Vasco da Gama and his crew would face a very steep learning curve. As they entered the bay, they docked at a town in Mozambique. This wasn't just a small village. It was a sophisticated city dotted with buildings, a vibrant port, and mosques. The Sultan peacefully approached them, confusing the Portuguese as being Muslim traders. Vasco da Gama, to his credit, played along to sustain the ruse. But their credibility soon came into question as their ships were in a deplorable state. And the gifts that da Gama could offer, brass bells, coral, modest cloth, were no more than trinkets to the Sultan and his administrators. And when nobody in the fleet could produce a Quran, the Sultan began to suspect that Vasco was not what he appeared. Despite the mounting tensions, the Sultan did provide the Portuguese fleet a pilot when he was asked to do so. However, on March 10, 1498, the ships docked at a nearby island to conduct the Christian Mass. The loaned pilot, seeing this, fled, and da Gama surmised correctly that their cover was blown. It was time to get on the move, but the prevailing winds prevented departure, and their stores of water were running low. On midnight of March 22nd, Vasco da Gama returned to the city and attempted to secretly enter the harbor to obtain fresh water. 
Their presence was alerted, and for the next three days, the Sultan's men viciously fought him. However, the Portuguese brought their cannon to bear and drove them back, destroying a portion of the city in the process. On March 25th, the Portuguese were able to seize water along with some hostages and then fled the port, making it a point to bombard the city as they left. Sailing north was difficult, the winds were just not favorable. It wasn't until April 7th of 1498 that they arrived at the port of Mombasa. Here, the pattern would repeat. The locals initially approached bearing gifts, though the mood was much more cautious. Then later, as the São Gabriel was being brought into the harbor steered by local guides, it rammed into another ship. The Portuguese panicked and tortured the guide, forcing a confession that this had been done intentionally. The people of the city retaliated by attempting to board the ships at night, but this was eventually driven back. Once again, it was time to move on. However, as the fleet made its way north, it resorted to piracy, attacking and seizing two ships along the way. Vasco da Gama, after all, desperately wanted a pilot that could take him across the Indian Ocean, but in this encounter, he would come up empty-handed. On April 14, 1498, they arrived at the city of Malindi in modern-day Kenya. Here, the reception was much more friendly, albeit da Gama refused to go ashore. However, as a show of goodwill, he did release his prisoners. Diplomacy in this case worked. Roger Crowley brings it home. Quote, Vasco da Gama was anxious to obtain a pilot, and it took another hostage seizure to extract one. The Sultan dispatched a, quote, Christian, who was willing to steer the expedition across the ocean to their desired destination. It was more likely a Gujarati Muslim who possessed the chart of the Western Indian Ocean and was familiar with quadrants for taking astronomical observations. 500 years later, Arab captains would still be cursing this pilot's name, who was the first to let the Portuguese into the secrets of the ocean's navigation. Eventually, the locals would refer to the Portuguese by the derogatory Hindi name for foreigner. They would call them the Ferengi." End quote. On April 24, 1498, the Portuguese departed Malindi. With the monsoon winds at their back, they left the African coast well behind them. They traveled in a northeastern direction, and on April 29th, da Gama spotted the North Star once again. On May 18th, after 23 days on the open ocean, high mountains were spotted on the horizon. These were the Western Ghats, a chain of mountains on the western coast of India. Overall, it had been 309 days since they left Portugal. The fleet had gone 12,000 miles. They had finally arrived along the Malabar coast. The magnificent trading hub of Calicut was nearby. This was a grand moment in history. Vasco da Gama had done it. He had discovered a sea passage to India. The fleet quickly made its way to Calicut and its extraordinary markets of spice. Everybody on board could tell that there was vast wealth to be had. That said, wherever there was extreme wealth, there would also be extreme danger. Vasco da Gama, his men, and his ships were now sailing right into the middle of it. 